I think, Tim, are we open to questions? If you feel like you've exhausted your comments, we can open to questions and hopefully the senator can come back. Oh, Leslie. So not to, yes, Leslie Harris, I'm the president of CDT. So not to put a damper on the party. Oh, come on. But, I mean, my sense is that we may have hit the high watermark with 230. And certainly Todd, who's, who, you know, and Danny, who joined me on sort of what's happening globally. You know, I'm seeing greater and greater demands for, you know, sort of legal obligations on intermediaries. We're having a fight in Congress right now about greater, greater demands on intermediaries. So on the one hand, to the extent Europe in its directives has a not as good, but Section 230-like, we can all take credit for that and in a number of other places. But I can think of no place that's celebrating except us. And so I'm fairly concerned about that. And I guess my question is, you know, is there room for hope here? Are we going to have to sort of like just say, okay, anything you want on copyright, but otherwise we've got intermediary protections? You know, where are we going in the future? Because I'm headed to a hate speech meeting in London where they're going to say to me, you have takedown obligations for copyright and you don't have takedown obligations for hate speech. So advice, thoughts about where we're going globally? The question is, is there hope? Well, I guess the question is. I'm trying to figure that out. The question is, is anybody more hopeful than I am about where I'm seeing globally? And I think the question is, is anybody more hopeful than I am about where I'm seeing globally? Well, let me give it to them. Because perhaps you missed the title of this, which is celebrating 15 years of the legislation that saved the Internet. But, you know, with that said, if, you know, I'm happy to answer questions. I agree to come. And I think that's what's happening. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
But as I said, filters become very, very hard to constantly maintain and adapt. And most courts are willing to, to listen to that. It costs a lot of money. I give the example of the uh, – we do take down – in Germany, we take down um, anti-Semitic listings. And generally, every other week, we'll get a list from the Central Committee of the Jewish Community in Berlin of new terms that are, that are anti-Semitic terms, and we'll run a filter – to try to have those um, taken out and, and do the best we can. And on a Thursday, we got a list, and our folks in Germany put in the filter Jude, J-U-D-E. And on Monday, someone walked in and said, over the weekend on our German site, every Jude Law film had been blocked. <laughs> and not a tragedy, right? <laughs> but no, there's some good Jude Law films. I disagree with that. But that, that's the, the, the filtering that's, obligation and the, and the desire for people to say, you can control your systems and therefore prevent future harm from occurring is really where I think the, the greatest challenge lies and where there are these – the examples are numerous and the harms are quite extensive that, that come from that. So I, here's why I think we should all be hopeful, especially you, Leslie. Um, the – no, that's all right. Uh, 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 but I think I think the reason to be uh, being hopeful doesn't mean being naive, and it doesn't mean pretending that there are no problems because there certainly are significant challenges, and I expect there will continue to be significant challenges. But I think that if you if if you go back and think about where the whole idea of two thirty came from to begin with, I think it actually came from understanding how people who were operating internet and other online services at the time were functioning. It, 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 it wasn't a sort of a pie in the sky, oh, gee, if we did this, maybe we'd get an internet. It was more, how are we going to keep it? How, how, how can we approach these questions in a sensible way, given what we know from the people who were operating these systems, both from a business perspective and a technical perspective? And and the reason I think to be hopeful is because I think that the Internet is successfully spreading around the world. And um, whether it's just in a, in a, on a commercial basis, uh, whether it's, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, people in one country or another uh, after another who work for eBay or people who run competitors to eBay in other countries – they're in the same business that – they're in the same Internet business, and they have the same concerns, and, they're, and, and each country is going to go through this same discussion. But I think the reason to be hopeful is that, to a large extent, I think they're going to have to come to similar conclusions uh, if they want to keep this environment. If they don't, then, you know, then there are a lot of other things they could do. Uh, but, but, but I think that's a real um, – that is a, a genuinely felt imperative uh, um, in, in lots of places. No, can I scare you again, though? Right. So the, one of the great concerns I think that we look at is really the, the change as to who the gatekeepers are, right? So that if the gatekeeper is the governments, in, some, in many places the gatekeepers are the governments, right? The, the Chinese Internet and the, the Great Wall does limit an enormous amount of content flowing into China. From our perspective, it's, it's many instances private entities – acting as gatekeepers and as platforms who have commercial interests in play throughout all the different parts of the Internet, through the application layers, through the network layers. And, and we see this in the mobile space. And Jerry was kind enough to send around an article this week. But at what point is there an obligation in which the commercial entities become utilities? And at what point, how do, and 230 doesn't do anything around, around this area, but it is something in which we all have collectively have a way in which we have to think about some of the issues that are driven by commercial gatekeepers, much more so than just government gatekeepers. Can, can I just make one comment? Sorry, let me go, go ahead. Hi, Steve Delianco, Net Choice. Question for Todd. A kudos for the clarity of 230 where it says, no provider shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of information provided by another. But despite the clarity, NetChoice has, has joined on a couple of amicus briefs where lower courts took it upon themselves to determine whether the platform was worthy or entitled to the protection. So the question would be, do you 
Do you feel that you have to work that out one case at a time, or should Congress try to clarify to make what was clear even clearer still? No, I'm going to defer to Jerry. He has something to um, I think it's really it, the, the statute is just fundamentally clear on its face that that you're not in the business of, the the courts are not in the business of choosing the right platform even though it has that that parental control some courts have tried to read that as limiting it to only those efforts where you're trying to um, uh, protect kids from from indecent con- content are you are you free from liability. But that's just not the way the statute was drafted or intended. It was really much broader than that. It was a substitute for Exxon, and it meant to deal with the Stratton Oakmont uh, prodigy case, which which was holding them liable for for uh, defamation. And it was also to say that intermediaries were free to run their their sites the way they wanted to. There was a theory of both the Good Samaritan. There's a tension always for voluntary ordering. One was we really wanted to encourage good Samaritan. It's a good Samaritan statute so that the private sector has to act responsibly and they can, you know, create the sites the way and their services they want to. The theory of freedom underlying that was one that the government wasn't doing it. But the second was at the time we were talking about multiple ISPs where Users would have a choice between going – there would always be another space that could be organized in a different way. There might be the prodigy for really family-friendly. There would be AOL, which would be a little more uh, adult, and then maybe a wide-open ISP. And that was the, the freedom of free speech of multiple ISPs. I don't know whether, Todd, you were going to the utility question. I mean, when some of these um, – uh, our platforms they achieve enormous market power, and where 800 million people are on Facebook, and they they begin to dominate the space. The question is whether the government then, lo- and as filtering technology becomes more more uh, robust, some of the arguments that we made that you can't filter, and so uh, the, the intermediaries wouldn't know what was on their site. That whole regime or argument begins to to look a little shaky so that it, a, a government that, that moved into this space might be able to take apart the, 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 the fundamental theory behind 230. How's that for good news? Um, Sorry, it's a celebration. <laughs> <laughs> Just reminding everybody. <laughs> um, picking up a little bit on what was said, uh, Ed Black, Computer Communications Industry Association. Um, as I guess I look at the world, I really see kind of, if you will, a, a global competition for two models of Internet. One, which I think 230 is symbolic of, is an open, uh, a maximally possible open Internet, and you have, let's say, the Chinese model. And countries around the world are looking both from a political, cultural, and economic focus, which is best. What I think is most troubling to me right now is, A, I mean, that's a tough battle, and we may not be winning in a lot of countries. And I think the State Department, among others, gets great credit for being out there forcefully in the right direction. But that there are things going on in the U.S. government that are sending the contrary signal. And and we have – I'll talk about protect protect IP, and I've not seen a – clear denunciation of some of the negative impacts that would have on an open Internet out of administration, which frankly campaigned on a very great Internet platform. Um, And we would like to think that that competition, uh, that our side is in fact consistently forceful for an open uh, Internet. And in various international fora, um, USTR and others are not as strong as uh, at all as we'd like. And if you, I know, Danny, I, you've done a great job, but put you on the spot. But the truth is, on a lot of these issues, the administration does not seem to speak with a single strong voice. Is that a question? Is there a question and there? Questions, <laughs> yes. And can we expect a, a more forceful voice, pro-internet, open internet, from the administration? Uh, I think you could con- you could expect a continued strong voice for an open internet uh, <laughs> that that balances openness and rule of law. That's what I think uh, that that is guided by what our legal foundations are by 230, by DMCA, and 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 by the very idea that's in 230 
that we do, in certain cases, look to intermediaries, to service providers, uh, to take voluntary actions, uh, um, obviously in a, in, a, in a transparent due process context. Um, I think that's what you can expect, and I think that's what you see us advocating in the OECD. That's what you see us advocating uh, in, in a number of trade discussions. There's, I think, a very important discussion going on in the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, discussion. Um, you know, if for, for those who want to think that 230 is the beginning and end of Internet policy, um, I, I think that's just an ahistoric view. Uh, um, you know, 18 months later, or whatever the exact number of months is, uh, uh, we, we passed a DMCA. And um, I think that we, we continue to look at, at how, to, how to strike that balance properly. And, and I think that most importantly, most importantly, uh, our, thank you, Tim. Um, I think most importantly, what, what the experience that we've had over the last 15 years shows is that we can, is that the combination of those two works well. Uh, that, that we don't have to back away from intellectual property protection in order to have an open Internet environment. Uh, uh, I just I, – I, I think that any – you know, you, you can't say 230 is great for the Internet, uh, uh, but somehow DMCA is a problem um, uh, because we've had them both. Um, and, and I think what we've, what, we've, what we've seen is a system where we've kind of worked out the, a lot of the difficult issues, and we'll continue to work out the difficult issues on the margin of, of where liability limitation starts and ends and how to handle um, uh, uh, notice and take down regimes in a, in a responsible way. I think that's always going to be with us in large part because, as Todd said, the platforms are going to keep changing. The platforms that we're focused on are – are, are no longer, as Jerry said, just the ISPs. Uh, there's all kinds of other intermediaries in the intermediate spaces, <laughs> and and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna have to keep reinterpreting, kind of to Steve's point, what what it means to have no liability, um, uh, depending on depending on where you sit. All right, well, but, um, but I think we're heading in, in in a very positive direction, and I think we're 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 setting the right kind of example around the world. I have three questions back here, and hopefully some of them will be in the celebratory vein. Uh, <laughs> I should have got a I should have got a cake with 15 candles on it to mark. Uh, <laughs> if it was all celebratory, everyone would be on be unemployed in this room. I mean, that's a, Did I lead us in a rousing rendition of Cool in the Gang celebration, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> would be helpful. Hi, Adam. Uh, hi, I'm Adam Thier with uh, the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Um, so, Danny, your your point about DMCA and it's sort of the notice and takedown model that was my question, which is. There's an attack underway from a lot of academics these days on 230. Uh, if you read a book like The Offensive Internet, which came out earlier this year, a collection of essays, which was basically almost sort of an anti-230 jihad, if you will. I mean, every essay was saying, we've got to do something about 230. And it was really interesting because the grounds that, of the attack were much more focused on privacy, reputation, and anonymity. And we haven't heard a lot of talk about that today, but we're starting to see models come out of the academy for a modified DMCA-like notice and takedown regime based upon those concerns. Um, we see this tension manifest itself in legislation, you know, things like eraser buttons and other affirmative obligations on intermediaries to take down certain types of content on reputational grounds. How do you balance that tension? I, I know this is an important priority for the Obama administration, so there's clearly a tension here. You know, I, I, I don't know... I don't know how much – I mean, one could certainly speculate in an academic sense about, about how to apply a notice and takedown model to, to, to consumer privacy protection. It's not the approach that we're looking to. The approach that we're looking to is based on, you know, very well-established fair information practice principles applied um, in kind of the current – uh, internet environment with an emphasis actually on a lot of the affirmative 230 principles with an emphasis on individual empowerment, um, uh, making sure that, that, that people have tools to control um, uh, how their information is used and, and, and where it's used and making sure that there are accountability mechanisms in, mechanisms, uh, in place. Um, you know, I think if you look at the role of, of, of intermediaries in privacy protection, um, it's a for the most part, a relatively uh, uh, bright line. Um, 
I mean, intermediaries don't have a lot of choice, for example, about whether they uh, comply with a law enforcement uh, uh, electronic surveillance order or not. They do it or not based on, uh, you know, based on what the what the substantive privacy law uh, requires. Um, so I think I think the privacy question is really important. I, I I think it's tempting to to look to the DMCA model, um, but I don't. This is just a personal statement. I don't think that um, I don't think that our First Amendment uh, is all that friendly to the idea that all personal information is property. Uh, and I think you'd have to go in that direction. And I just I don't I don't think that I don't think that's where the the mainstream of the privacy community, whether the advocates or the uh, the commercial entities are really thinking. Hi, uh, Tim Sparapani. Um, I, I was, Danny, you actually anticipated my question. I was going to ask whether we needed a 230-like provision to protect apps and, more importantly, platforms from the failure of apps to uh, utilize common sense privacy principles or security. So here's the scenario we've seen over and over again. Uh, platform puts out a, a set of principles, an app goes ahead and uses data they shouldn't use or they, they create a vulnerability that they should have probably addressed. Somebody finds out. The plaintiff's bar turns around and sues the platform. Uh, the platform turns around and says to the app uh, industry, you've got to do X, Y, and Z in the future. Somebody fails to do it. Shouldn't we protect the platforms who have suggested uh, some provisions that should be followed by apps? in order to continue to make those intermediaries strong and stronger in the future? Um, I guess I think what we should be clear on is what the privacy obligations of all of those parties are. Um, our, our work on privacy um, and, and, I, and what I think um, is a lot of the FTC's work on privacy is, is aimed at the substantive questions of what should be the obligations of those who handle personal information. Um, I'm sure there's at some point along the way a 230 angle as between apps and platforms. Uh, it's an interesting issue, but I, I guess I think the overriding question is, is what, are the, what are the privacy obligations of those different parties? I think we have to sort that out first, really. Um, uh, and that's obviously happening to some extent through through private contractual relationships between the platforms and the apps. But uh, you know, our view is that we need um, better guidance in the form of enforceable codes of conduct, and we hope ultimately a statute that would clarify obligations. I think that would would reduce the the friction or the confusion, whatever it is, but that you're hypothesizing between apps and and and, and platforms. Uh, we have a question here, and Danny, if I don't mention it later, I do appreciate you coming to talk about the history and the origin of Section 230. <laughs> Thank you so much for playing. Um, another question? Yeah, Juliana with National Journal. Do you see any similarities between what you, you know, the fights you faced in the 90s that led to 230 and the calls by IP owners to require third parties to take additional actions to combat online piracy, you know, some of the things that are in the Protect IP Act? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, you can ask me more questions. <laughs> I think, I think Danny, if I can ask a question, if I may, um, and it was kind of inspired by Adam Thayer's Dr. Spock look um, when he was at, went to an alternative universe. Just bear with me here. Let's just say, let's just say there were two universes. Uh, in one Congress, in one universe, and another Congress, in another universe, one passed uh, the Communications Decency Act, the Exxon Amendment. Uh, one passed Section 230, the Internet Freedom and Family Empowerment Act. Uh, Senator Wyden, Senator Co I mean, Congressman Wyden, Congressman Cox. We just told that story exactly. But what let's happened. Just, and let's just say in the in the universe that had um, Senator Exxon's amendment, the Supreme Court uh, found that it didn't violate the First Amendment. Uh, Reno wins over ACLU. Which statute, given uh, their attempts to protect children, which in their entirety, which statute do you think would be more effective at protecting children, given the entirety of what we know now? <laughs> well, all, it seems to me that all we know is the world, the world where 230 prevailed and, 
and I think that we have a very robust child protection environment online, thanks to a whole number of factors. Um, could there have been a better result if we had a, uh, a kind of indecency regulatory regime? Um, I guess I think you can look at television over the last 20 years and wonder about whether that's a good model <laughs> uh, if your concern is to somehow protect kids against indecency. Um, but that's about as far as I'm willing to go with the hypothetical. Uh, the, the answer is I think you probably could have a much more child-friendly Internet, but then you wouldn't have the Internet because it would, it, it would be – there would be – speech would be chilled across all of these platforms to make it look like television and have no malfunctions, no seven dirty words anywhere on the Internet, goodbye to the blogosphere, um, a lot of chilling speech on all intermediaries. It would have just been an alternative wasteland, and the Internet would have been stifled. Thanks. Stephen Balkan with the Family Online Safety Institute. Jerry, you and I both testified at the first Senate Judiciary hearing on basically porn and the Internet. So two things to celebrate. One was Thank you. we got out of the yeah 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 we survived Senator Grass. Well, we first of all we survived, so there's three things to celebrate. Um, the second was that at the time the only so-called study or research was the dreadful Rim study, which of course led to the front page of the, uh, the front cover of Time and so on, and that's what the conversation was based on. And so something to celebrate first of all is the emergence of folks like Pew and. Uh, Sonia Livingston in the EU, and there's an incredible body of really good academic research. More is coming out all the time that we can now use when we're up here on the Hill or we're in Parliament or whatever. Um, the second thing I, I recall from that day was how the senators were falling over themselves to declare themselves computer illiterate, illiterate apart from Pat Leahy, who by that time, in, am amazingly, in 1995, had already held his first electronic town hall meeting but the others were saying, oh, I've never even seen a website. You know, my staff do all my email for me. What is email? You know, stuff like this. So those are three things to celebrate. Um, so I've done the celebration. Now I do have a, a kind of a question that goes back to Leslie's original uh, concerns. We, we're seeing the ITU uh, with their Child Online Protection Initiative um, trying to dr drum up support internationally, particularly in developing countries, for a very top-down codes of conduct industry, you will do this approach. Um, and at the same time, from the EU, Nelly Cruz, who's the commissioner for the digital agenda, has rather surprisingly come up with uh, a range of things that she wants to see industry do in the next six to nine months, including rating systems for the Internet. Right. Um, and with various ideas that have long ago been seen to be not very helpful. And if industry doesn't do it, then we will legislate. So your comments on that. Well, my comments on that is, is what I said after Senator Wyden left, that I don't think we've improved on the model of what allows us to keep free and balance these interests out. It was enormous cooperation between the, the Internet community, intermediaries, the civil liberties groups, the, the civil – and even um, efforts to educate each other. The COPA Commission, which came after, uh, brought all the family groups together, and there was a great dialogue. And, and the result of that was a decision that, that we really – education was the way to go, and we shouldn't pass another um, overriding governmental regulation that that wasn't going to work. That educational process, that dialogue process, which I think continues in the United States, I know CDT, not to, not to push our agenda, but has been to try and move that kind of continuing dialogue globally. And that's always been a struggle, which is to – we don't have a strong uh, a NGO sector in, uh, around the world. Uh, and I don't think we uh, – Leslie can speak to this. It's the – does the industry and the academics and people come together and say, let's try and find the most effective way to protect kids in the least restrictive way and protect speech. That's, that's, a, that's a cooperative effort. And, and I don't think without that cooperative private stakeholder effort that 
Danny Weissner or any government agency is going to do – is going to be in a position to do the right thing. It needs that push. It needs someone to say the tools are effective or they may not be as effective as you'd like them to be, but we can do better. Or here's how we're doing it and here's what's around the corner. That work, one of the ironies of 230 is it kind of says you can go to sleep until some crisis happens because you're not going to be liable. That wasn't the intent of the statute. It was a good Samaritan statute that said work to balance these things out and continue the dialogue. One other person who's missing today is Ron Plesser, who was always in that room working with us to try and – industry and civil society and civil liberties organizations to work those solutions out. So if there's a multi-stakeholder process, Danny certainly needs it, and we ought to be doing it, and we try to do it. Yeah, Bruce McCauley. Tim, first of all, before I get into the question, I'll apologize for focusing more on the hangover than the celebration. But it occurs to me the open Internet is a nice rhetoric, but there was a time in history when open sewers were considered acceptable practices. I work in IT security, and I have to deal with the downside of that. It seems to me that with the focus on liability and promoting the development of these services that we haven't at the same time focused on accountability. And that's another problem with the whole privacy area. Specifically, in a lot of the legislation, commercial interests have worked hard to ensure that there are legal protections to keep their products and their commercial interests as opaque as possible and to punish researchers by prohibiting third-party reverse engineering investigation of security issues. The question that I have, and this is specifically motivated this morning on Facebook, Sophos was talking about an individual in Australia that found a problem, a security issue with the financial firm holding his accounts. For reporting it, their legal folks are attacking him. He's basically being punished for doing a good thing. The question I have is, do you see a possibility or a need for some kind of safe harbor or whistleblower protection for outsiders that investigate and practice responsible disclosure about security problems? Because those otherwise are causing harm to individuals and the current legal structure actually protects the interests that are responsible for that harm, even though they don't bear any consequences of it. I would answer. I think it's – you want to try it, Tom? No. My answer is that the intention of the researcher to reverse engineer and figure out the hole in the system is noble. The question is trying to sit down and figure out how you would define that into legislation, where you're defining the good guy versus the hacker and the reverse engineer who's trying to end your privacy would be almost a very, very difficult exercise. I think it's almost impossible to do. Let me just go to one more question. Leslie, you want to go? Thank you. Steve Metalitz. I want to compliment the panel. This is an excellent panel, and the fact that none of you look a day older than you did 15 years ago is further testament to the power of Section 230. I'd like to celebrate an aspect of Section 230 that actually Danny mentioned, but some other folks in the room maybe aren't so happy about, and that is the exceptions to Section 230. Section 230E, which include that it has no effect on prosecution of federal criminal law. It has no effect on the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And my personal favorite, it has no effect on intellectual property law. Let me ask, looking back, do you think that we got the right exceptions in the law in 1996? Were there some others that should have gone in there? And really going back to what Todd said, 
if there had been more exceptions, would that have perhaps relieved some of the pressure the courts obviously feel to construe the basic liability limitation in Section 230 as narrowly as possible? So, full disclosure, in the 96, during the, uh, during the, the CDA debate, um, I was an outside attorney for the Business Software Alliance, so I was a supporter at the time of the, uh, of the IP provision and appreciate what Becca did. Um, and, and I think it goes to the point in which there were other federal statutes that were in the midst of being developed or were currently in there, and it was, it was a, it is a, it is an okay place to separate out different types of liability for different types of acts and, and ways in which they get um, apportioned. And you see the difference being in the European model with an e-commerce directive, which is a horizontal directive and applies to everything, and then you have a constant pushback in which you get the um, IPRED to and the, the copyright directive and the software directive. And so it continuously comes up, and there's lots of different places in which you're going to see different, slightly different liability regimes. And I think that makes sense because there are different expectations and different obligations that should attach for different types of activities. So the spectrum is, right, I mean, the spectrum was protecting children in most instances is probably going to be higher on the society value than necessarily how we handle Internet gambling, right, even though that's one in which there's a pretty strict and stringent regime for intermediaries with Internet gambling. So I always think you should go back and look at who, and it goes to Tim's point earlier about who should carry the liability in many instances, because not just how do they benefit from it, are they in a position to stop or prevent the harm that we generally recognize as a harm? If you go from that point of view, a lot of times the, 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 the outcomes that governments are able to put together work. I mean, there's a reason why 15 years later we haven't overturned the CDA, right? I mean, the CDA itself was, but Section 230 has survived. There's a reason why 12, 13 years later the DMCA is basically still intact, right? And the, the e-commerce directive is still intact in Europe, and the, the copyright directive is still intact. They seem to be working in most instances, and that tension that's going to constantly be there from interested parties that have valid interests are really what governments and policymakers have to confront, and it's going to be continuously challenged. So I'm still on the optimistic side that governments do a pretty good job here with the private sector and, and everyone in the room activity to continuously press the issues in all the forum that we all deal with. Just politically, I mean, we could probably think of other exceptions that one could work with, but it's also who's in the room. And what was intended? I mean, the, the copyright industry is there to protect its interests. We were trying to get Section 230 through. Whether it was, you know, totally, uh, you know, a perfect statute, I don't know. We had two, but two big issues was to was to create a regime for intermediate information service providers, and at the same time, not to affect. And this is was talking with David Sohn the other day telecommunications providers. We were not trying to deal with common carriage. We were trying to deal with people who were providing information services. And it was the, you know, the, the scalpels in the room were working on that regime. If someone wants to create an exception, what, what you have to have a coalition. You have to put together a pretty good argument for it. You need to develop a regime that makes it work for everyone as, as reasonably as possible. That's what the DMCA did in the copyright area. We haven't gotten any um, additions to that because that coalition hasn't come together. Can I just make one? I think it's an interesting question, Stephen. Just one observation about the world in which that whole the whole statute was written. Interestingly, it was a world that was much more about, if I could say, pure speech. So the as you remember, the 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 the, the liability issues that were really front and center on the table were defamation issues and maybe other kinds of more speech-related uh, uh, liability. I don't think that um, – I certainly didn't have in my mind, I don't think we had in, in our mind, um, a sense of the amount of commerce and commercial activity that would be happening in these environments. Um, so I think that tells you something about where the statute was focused and where the exceptions were focused. Um, we weren't thinking guys, about when eBay. When was eBay started? What year? Uh, September 95. 
We didn't know about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nor did I at the time. Right. Right. So with that, the reason we did such a good job is we didn't know very much about what we were doing. <laughs> I don't want to. I think we did. Well, let, let me ju let me just say, um, I, I was in no way, shape, or form responsible for the creation or passage of Section 230 in any way. But I'm really humbled um, to hear the perspectives of the people that were there then. I'm also humbled uh, to hear about people we've lost, like Ron Plesser and Bruce Ennis and, and Judith Krug, um, who are real heroes in my mind. Um, but I, I'm glad we were able to blow out the candles, even if the hangover started a little bit early, um, because I think it's an astoundingly sublime statute. Um, and I also appreciate Danny's comment that um, he only appreciated maybe 10 percent or 20 percent of the actual import of the thing as, as they're moving through it. And, and Jerry says the good thing was we didn't know enough. But um, I, I really thank everybody for sharing their perspectives on this. Senator Wyden, the, car, the Congressional Internet Caucus co-chairs, Congressman Goodlatte, Congresswoman Eshoo, Senator Leahy, and Senator Thune for, for co-hosting with us. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming.